In our third and final programme in the series, A Tale of Three Norries, we meet Tony O'Shea. It certainly is different from the previous two programmes, with singer-songwriter John Neville and songwriter John Murphy. Yes, we will be delving into Tony's involvement with music, and certainly talking about his famous father. But the programme this evening will also concentrate on the job that Tony had before retiring. A mention of retiring conjures up an age bracket of 65 to 70 years. However, being a Cork City fireman, Tony was required to retire at the young age of 54. If you believe that 54 is far too early to retire, well bear in mind that being a fireman is a serious job. Your fitness levels must always be 100%. It could save your life and the life of your colleagues. So, Tony the City Fireman, Tony the Singer and Musician, and Tony the Nari will make up our third and final programme, The Tale of Three Naris. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and welcome to Where the Road Takes Me. How could you be Tony O'Shea and not be involved in music? His dad was, after all, the late John O'Shea, the singing fireman, so the house was full of music. But more than that, because John O'Shea was not only an entertainer, but a character, a baker, a cook, a gardener, a family man, and all-round great friend to all. His great friend, singer Sean O'Shea, recorded many interviews with me. Not one was recorded without Sean mentioning his friend. But nobody obviously knew him better than his family, including his son, Tony. At the time, the corporation was building new houses above there, and they got a house in St. Enders Road. He lived there until he got married, actually, and um, he met lots of friends there, and he went to the school in the North Monastery. And um, from then on, he worked for farmers around that area. There was a, there was a lot of fields and farm land around that, that area at that time. He loved working for farmers, and he worked for Father of Flynn, actually, yeah. at one stage. Sean yes. told me about him. Did he? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I suppose, you know, people growing up in the city nowadays can't imagine somebody working for a farmer, but in those days, the city was almost immediately into the country. It was. It was, it was right alongside of the country, actually. Um, so, like, he'd just walk across, we'd say, you know, Churchfield, that, that area. It was just open fields and farmland back there, and he could walk there for for days on end, you know, and come home in the evenings, and he loved it. He loved horses, he loved, you know, working with livestock, and, you know, he had great stories about uh, working out in, in that area. But he left school very young, and um, that's what he did, until he uh, eventually got a job uh, in the Sunbeam, Woolsley, in, in, in Cork City, and um, he worked the night shift there. He was a, a helper maintaining the machines at night time when the factory was closed down. As you know, the workforce in the, in the Sunbeam at the time was huge. And there was a lot of characters there, and a lot of a lot of stories went around, you know, um, about about Cork, and you know, and he picked up a lot of that, that folklore, and and um, he picked up a lot of songs there, and that's where he got his love of the north side and his love of singing and songs. At the time, he was taking part in a lot of shows around the area on the north side, little shows in uh, different little theatres. But um, he bought a guitar, and that was just the start of it. He yeah. loved. He started singing himself then, and he was practised then at night time, below in the sunbeam during the, the, the downtime, and he drove a lot of the workers mad, I'm sure, below there, like, <laughs> practising his new songs. And uh, But um, he stayed there for, I think it was about five or six years, and then he got a job in Cork City Fire Brigade. One dark stormy night, not a star was in sight. The north wind came howling down the line. There stood a brave engineer with a sweetheart so dear and his orders to pull old number nine. She kissed him goodbye with a tear in her eye. The joy in his heart he could not hide. The whole world seemed bright, for she told him that night that tomorrow she'd be his blushing bride. Oh, the wheels hummed the stone as the train rolled along, and the black smoke came pouring from the stand. The whole world, it seemed, seemed to brighten his dream of tomorrow when he'd be rolling back. 
sped from the hill and his grey's heart stood still. A headlight was shining in his face. He whispered a prayer as he threw on the air, for he knew this would be his final race. John O'Shea with a song called The Tale of the Number Nine. Well, having a father affectionately referred to as the singing fireman, it wasn't a huge surprise that his son Tony would have an interest in music and possibly follow in his father's steps to become a fireman himself. Growing up, we were kind of surrounded by music and my father was always coming in with some other artist and friend from the music business, you know. And um, there was always a guitar in our house and there was always songs being bandied about like so it was easy for me to pick it up and you know different from the other two lads I had um, a background in music like you know starting off so my sister played music and you know uh, so it, um, it was part of the family really you know. Did you grow up close to the man here? I did yeah, yeah. yeah just down just near John Murphy there Cattle Market Avenue off Shannon Street and um, so we that was our our playground really you know so we spent our days just hanging around Shandon and uh, Shandon Street we off went up to Bonties where John Neville was living and uh, our first house was 90 up Fair Hill which was across from Churchfield Telecom here and building like Fair Hill reaches from the Blackstone Bridge down to Wiltone Street so up Fair Hill is on the Blackstone Bridge up to the top where Churchfield Aircom is and then Fair Hill then is from there back down to Wiltone Street so it is a long a long area um yeah so like we we grew up around there and um as with the lads we went to north the north press uh and um then came to up to money here so like the two giants here we i left two at 15 years old and started serving my time as a carpenter then after seven years the recession hit and we were out of work so i had the opportunity to join the fire brigade as my father was in the fire brigade and did so, he encourage you to to join well, he did. I, I joined the Civil Defence first in Cork, the Auxiliary Fire Service side of it, just for an interest. And uh, I liked it. And he said to me on a few occasions, he said, look, there could be jobs coming up. He said, are you interested in this? I said, I am. Yeah, I am. So he found out that they were holding interviews in the City Hall on such a date. So I went in and um, had the interview. And I, I still had a year to finish in my time as a carpenter. We had to do five years back then. And uh, so they said to me, come back when you finish your time. So I was turned down on that, on that occasion and he went back again two years later and I got in that time, you know. Come on, lady, you come home early. Come on, big, when you're feeling small. You come home straight and you come home curly. Sometimes you don't come home at all. What in the world has come over you? What in heaven's name have you done? You've broken the speed and the sound of loneliness You're out there running just to be on the run I've got a heart that burns with a fever 
I've got a weary and a jealous mind How could a love that should last forever Get left so very far behind What in the world has come over you What in the heaven's name have you done You've broken the speed of the sound of loneliness You're out there running just to be on the run It's a mighty mean and a dreadful sorrow I've crossed that evil line today And how can we talk about tomorrow When we ain't got a word to say What in the world has come over you What in heaven's name have you done You've broken the speed of the sound of loneliness you're out there running just to be on the run Yeah, what in the world has come over you? What in heaven's name have you done? You've broken the speed of the sound of loneliness You're out there running just to be on the run Tony O'Shea singing a John Prine song entitled The Broken Speed of the Sound of Loneliness. It's from a CD that Tony recorded called My Lovely Rose and You. Well, getting into the fire service can be quite difficult. For instance, claustrophobia, lack of fitness or a fear of heights obviously would rule you out. And even if you get your foot inside the door, the tests that follow can be quite strenuous. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, uh, back then, you had to do a height test, you had to do a, cl- a claustrophobic test, you had to be able to swim, you had to have some kind of first aid course behind you. Um, it's a lot of uh, yeah. a lot of stuff to have on your CV. Yeah. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's um, all done by different outside agencies now, like UCC do the fitness side of it, and even though the Cork City Fire Brigade do their own tests, you know, for claustrophobic height tests and all that, there's a, st- uh, a stringent physical test and me- medical note, you know, when, when you go for the fire brigade itself. Obviously, back then, that was 30, 35 years ago. You know, it wasn't as, as tough, you know. What was it like then, retiring? Were you were you sad to let it go? I was. The job was changing a lot, you know. There was a lot, there was a, a lot of courses you had to go on and give, you know, be part of courses. So you, you spent a lot of time away from home. But, yeah, after making friends and inside there for 30 years, like, it's, it's, it's sad to go. Like, but, um, like, at 55, you have to go. But like after being part of your life for for years, it's um, not like you, you can close the door and forget about it, you know. Yeah, uh, and it's a very young age to retire. Isn't it? it is, yeah, 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 yeah. But like I think it has something to do with insurance. You, you're not covered by insurance in there after 55 because it's so physical, you know. So yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of guys inside that try to stay on, but they weren't allowed, you know. Yeah. Just... And in those 30 years that you were there, were there major fires you got to attend? Well, like people talk about major fires, you know, like the sun being low and and you know. Vita Cortex and, and fires like that. But those fires wouldn't worry me one bit, you know, because you know that you're only you're only fighting a building. You're trying to save a building, you know, and you know where the building ends and there's nobody in there, you know. Um, yeah. But it's the little house fires at three, four or five o'clock in the morning when you get there and there's flames coming out the top windows. That's And you're not aware who's in there. Yeah, that's when, you know, you're put the pin, to the pin of your collar then trying to find out, like, who's in there, you know, uh, is anybody trying to get a bit of information about the place before you reach the call, you know, and um, trying to, you know, get people out then and, you know, going, like when I was active myself inside or, um, you know, putting on a breathing set and going, in, going into a, build, a burning building is no easy job, you know, it's tough. Three friends, three North Mon boys, all involved in music and all with a different story to tell. This evening, we bring you the third and final programme in The Tale of Three Norries. It features Tony O'Shea, retired Cork City fireman, singer, musician and son of the legendary singing fireman John O'Shea. Part two in programme three gets up and running after the break.
The tale of three Norries on Where the Road Takes Me. And this evening in Program 3, we meet our third Nori, Tony O'Shea, retired Cork City fireman and son of the late John O'Shea, the singing fireman. So let's get a song right now from Tony CD. The song is the title track, a song he has dedicated to his late mum, who passed away not so very long ago. It was her favourite song, and a song she sang on many an occasion. It's called The Tale of Three Norries on Where the Road Takes Me. And this evening in Program 3, we meet our third Nori, Tony O'Shea. The Tale of Three Norries. The Tale of Three Norries on Where the Road Takes Me. And this evening in Program 3, we meet our third Nori, Tony O'Shea. Retired Cork City fireman and son of the late John O'Shea, the singing fireman. So let's get a song right now from Tony CD. The song is the title track, a song he has dedicated to his late mum, who passed away not so very long ago. It was her favourite song, and a song she sang on many an occasion. It's called My Lovely Rose and You. My lovely rose has lost its crimson gown And autumn leaves have tumbled over town The skies have changed their shade of blue And I have lost my lovely rose and you But someday soon the clouds will roll away And spring will bring another lovely day Like a miracle come true I'll wake to find My lovely rose and you The days grow cold The night is here too soon My dreams grow old And early shine the moon The skies have covered us with snow And I have lost the one I used to know But someday soon the snow will drift away and spring will bring another lovely day When like a miracle come true I'll wake to find my lovely rose and and my lovely Rose and you. Well, we spoke earlier about the stringent tests that everybody must go through to be selected for the fire service and the stringent training one must go through if you're lucky enough to be selected. However, Tony O'Shea says that when you're out on call and attending a fire, it's reassuring that those with you as well as yourself have been well trained and prepared for any outcome. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, when you go in there on, 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 we say on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning, whichever morning it is, and you look around and you see the crew there with you, uh, you know that they are well-trained guys and they're well able to do their job and you needn't have any worry about it. You know, on a few occasions you you be put on in a crew with a few of the young guys coming in and you know that, you know, you can't depend on them to, you know, have your back, you know. So being the senior member of the crew, you have to kind of take charge and, you know, look mm-hmm. after things. But um, when you progress on then become an officer inside, you know, you can't take part in the physical side of it. You have to start ordering people around that, you know, well, just giving out instructions and, um, and especially at fires, you know, you have to you have to have a level head and make sure you know what you're about, you know. So it's a different job completely when you get promotion inside. You're standing back then and you know watching things and right. all the progress, you know. So. Of course, the school here had so many famous sports people, very famous people attending here. Don Grady was here, Teddy McCarthy, I think, Tomas Mulcahy. Yeah, would spring to mind as fairly yeah. famous students here. Yeah, they would. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose like I was, I'd be older than Tomas anyway, so I can remember Tomas here, all right, but. Like I, I would have been gone before he came to kind of fame. I actually spent a lot of time hunting with Tomas's father, John Mulcahy. We did a lot of hunting um, with dogs and ferrets years ago. Like every Sunday morning, he was calling to my house and we'd head off for the day, you know. And uh, I'd often mention that to Tomas when I'd meet up with him, but um, he'd often acknowledge it like that. His father was just, uh, he was immersed in dogs and birds and, you know, uh, loved the outdoor life, you know. So, yeah, it, that was all part of growing up in Shannon Street and in the north side, you know, being part of that, that culture, you know. Come, boys, and you'll see lads and lassies full of glee. Famous for all, so they'd make your heart thrill. Though the boys, they won't harm you, the girls, they will charm you. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. Come, boys, and spend the day with our harrier club so gay. The cry of the hound, sure it would make your heart thrill. And when you hear Connie Doyle say, the armoured car has won today. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. So come, boys, and you'll see, lads and lassies full of glee. Famous for all, sure they'd make your heart thrill. The boys, they won't harm you, the girls, they will charm you. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. Come boys and spend the day with our bowl player so gay. The loft of the bowl shirt would make your heart thrill. And when you hear the shave I say, Timmy Delaney won today. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. So come boys and you'll see lads and lassies full of glee. Famous for all, sure they'd make your heart thrill. Though the boys, they won't harm you, the girls, they will charm you. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. To Fahey's well for a point of pure spring water The grandest place of all, sure the angels do say Where thousands come from all the form Far to view the Blarney Stone That can be seen from the groves of Fairhill So come boys and you'll see Lads and lassies full of glee Famous for all, sure they make your heart thrill for the boys, they won't harm you, the girls, they will charm you. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. Though the Rockies thought that they were stars, till they met with St. Philbars. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fairhill. And the Blackpool hens don't lay at all, when they lays, they lay some small. Here's up them all, says the boys of Fair Hill. 
Boys of Fairhill, of course, is yeah. a very famous song. Written by Sean O'Callaghan a long time ago. My father's favourite song actually was The Boys of Fairhill. Um, he gave it to Jimmy Crowley and Jimmy Crowley made his first album was called The Boys of Fairhill. And my father gave him, you know, Salonica and Lloyd George and all those songs that are on the album. Um, Jimmy used to come up to our house a lot and just take down notes and scribble down the words of the songs my father would, would, would make out for him. And um, in fairness to Jim, he acknowledges my father every time he sings any of those songs. And he said, like, that song was given to me by John O'Shea. And Lloyd George then was about? Fairhill. Yes. Yeah. It was just, um, it was a, like another version of the, boy, of the Boys of Fairhill, but a different tempo and different, uh, but like, that's just the first few lines of the song, you know. Lloyd George stands up and he gives a great size, saying there's an ancient old place called the Old Crappy Boy, uh, where Fenians of old, they were trained and were drilled, but the bravest of them all were the Boys of Fairhill. So that's one verse of the song, you know. It's written about an art side again, you know. The song The Boys of Fairhill, given to court balladeer Jimmy Crowley by John O'Shea, the singing fireman and Tony's dad. In fact, I'm certain that the song was also passed down from father to son. I'm also certain that a stage hadn't been built in Cork that the singing fireman hadn't performed on, and that would have meant that the law of averages would suggest that the paths of John O'Shea and Jimmy Crowley were bound to cross at some stage, if you'll pardon the pun. And of course they did. He was a hard man to avoid, and I'm glad I didn't avoid him, and I'm glad we shared the same the same ground for a long time. And uh, the interesting thing about the singing fireman, John O'Shea, was so good to me. There was another connection as well, John, that he and my, my grandfather, they lived around the same place in the north side, near Cattle Market Street. The two houses were very close, the Sheabys and the Crowleys. There was a big connection there, you know, because in the cosmos of Cork, you know. And I'm very proud of that. Now... One of the first early kind of guys who directed me and put me in the right direction for kind of local songs and authentic local songs was a man called Paul Frost, who was a great friend of, of uh, John O'Shea. So um, he said, you must meet the fireman sometime. He's great old songs. He said, you'd be singing country western. He says, and everything else that goes with it and every kind of a thing. But he says, he's good local songs. And I got to know him and he gave me Lie George. He gave me the, the guts of the armour car, even though I got a few verses after here and there, but the real version, a couple of verses of the Boys of Fairhill. And I was just beginning to understand a man called Sean O'Callaghan, who was a bit of a rake, but he was to spend, he used to spend all his time in the, in the Fairhill Harrier Club if they had a price of, of a half tier supporter. And it, in, he was just totally in love with his community, and they were very poor people, and they went drag hunting, hurling. They had a holding team in Fairhill as well, and Sean wrote the verses, and some of those verses became the boys of Fairhill. And it was John O'Shea, more than any man, told me he was able to had a personal connection with Sean O'Callaghan. He told me stories about his life, about his misadventures, and really close-up stuff that I wouldn't have got money for John O'Shea. Dogs, bowling, music, very yeah. popular in the north side. Yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah, yeah, we're all dogs. Like, on a, on a Sunday morning, if you took a walk around the north side, there, there'd be groups of, of, of men standing on corners. They'd have fishing rods, board cages, you know, uh, harriers, foot beagles. There was actually um, a, a group of otter hunters that used to um, meet on the North Cape Bridge. Uh, they had these big, like, African hounds, like, big huge dogs like but um so yeah it was all part of the uh, of growing up in the north side like um and you could be welcomed in to any of those uh, groups w you know with open arms like you just walked on and say want to join yeah come on away with us for the day and, and you could you know hook up with them but um yeah and so, of course the north side then wasn't as built up as it is now and you were fairly near to the country as well yeah, yeah. you were yeah yeah i mean like as john mentioned well ago bunty's field was just open countryside you know and up behind the parochial hall was just miles upon miles of open country so you were actually near near the countryside if you just walked say five or ten minutes you know it was uh, way different than when, when you know than what it is now today like it's, it's uh, completely changed you know tony o'shea tony of course is our third nari in our series the tale of three naris and that's the end of part two in program three. Part three in program three. The final part awaits you after the break.
part three in Programme 3, the final part in the series, The Tale of Three Norries. I'm in the company of the third Norrie this evening, Tony O'Shea. So now let's talk about another song handed down to him by his father. And if the boys of Fair Hill are popular up here, then so is a song called The Armoured Car. Now, while some people may think that this is a song about the War of Independence, it's not. It's all about one very famous dog. Yeah, yeah. song about a harrier. His name was, was Ringwood. It belonged to Fair Hill Harriers. Famous dog. He won a lot, a lot of prizes and a lot of races and uh, done through the years. And he was noted for plowing through ditches and plowing through briars and, you know, brambles and, you know, going head first in. And one of the, the huntsmen was standing next to uh, Connie Doyle, who was the, 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 one of the huntsmen with the Fair Hill Harriers. And he said that dog is like an armor car going through the, the barricades, like so. That's the nickname they put on him in the armor car. So um, his head is on a, on a plaque above in Fair Hill Harriers um, clubhouse at the moment, like so. Uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a, <laughs> a, a an <laughs> yeah. Welcome all ye good friends, and round me attend, I pray listen to my song. You must appreciate a home so great, if to the sport you belong. No land or title, did he ever own, and he cared not for who you are? Well, he was bred and was trained by the boys from Fair Hill, and they called him the Armoured Car. Facts to you I will disclose, he did check proof knows, and he never yet lost a hunt. He had cast iron jaws and steel padded paws Each nail was like an iron bar And from one mile to ten he'd never give in If you ran him from here to Castlebar Sure t'was no wonder gentlemen That the boys from Fair Hill used to call him the armoured car In the year of 21, when he started to run, having surveyed the countryside all round, he sent a sworn declaration to the Harrier Association that he cared not for man, hair, nor hound. And he swore right there and then that if he didn't win to Fair Hill, he'd never return. And sure, the British fleet would have to retreat from Doyle's armoured car. At the siege of Waterloo, sure ye all knew how he held the enemy low. From the finish to the start, he broke the Blarney dog's heart. And he surpassed the evening star And when they thought he was done From the heat of the sun That the armour on fire would go Who should be coming to the front And leading the hunt Was Doyle's armoured car When the Free State Bill was framed and peace was proclaimed, and the country slumbered in repose. North, south, east and west, he could not be suppressed, for he cared not for friend or for foe. And when the bow blackened tans, and their Saxon clans, to England sailed afar, with all their guns in rapture, and never could they capture Doyle's armoured car. Now here is my glass, and wrong let it pass, as we drink in a token of love. And to every hand that mine can expand, on earth and in heaven above, 
And to every hound who knows the ground No matter where you are Wouldn't it be Connie Doyle's delight If every hound here tonight Had the heart of the armoured car Wouldn't it be Connie Doyle's delight If every hound here tonight Had the heart of the armoured car Tony O'Shea singing a song handed down to him by his father entitled The Armoured Car, also to be found on Tony's CD, My Lovely Rose and You. Now, I've interviewed singer Sean O'Shea on many an occasion, and not once did he fail to mention his great friend, the singing fireman John O'Shea. Although they bore the same surname, they weren't related and obviously weren't brothers, but they might as well have been. Such was their close friendship. I suppose of all the people I met in show business, use that term, I said John O'Shea was my closest friend. He was a remarkable man. He was the type of man that every day since he died, I remember him and uh, I pray for him. And do you know something? I pray to him because he was a remarkably good Christian man and uh, he had many great qualities. I suppose John singing was only a small part of his life in that where do I start like um, gardening was a huge hobby of his and he was a very good gardener. And a cook as well I believe. Oh yeah, yeah. he always did the Christmas dinner <laughs> and he baked in latter years he baked wonderful brown bread and Eileen and myself are off recipients of a, a, a cake of John's brown bread and it was excellent but the garden he was always a very good gardener, but towards, I suppose, I don't know, maybe four, five, six years before he died, Tony, his son, built a thing for him called a polytunnel. It's kind of a plastic. glass house made out of, <laughs> glass yeah. house made out of plastic. Yeah. And it was his pride and joy. And the things he used to grow there, I think he had new potatoes all the year round. He often said to me that he was having new potatoes for Christmas and that kind of thing. Another uh, great hobby he had at one stage of his life was he'd go out along the marsh there towards Blarney and he'd get pieces of bog oak and he would come home clean them and make wonderful pieces out of them. He gave me one now, which is a treasured possession. It's kind of, every time you look at it, you see something different. It's a harp, but looks a bit like an eagle. And he was an extremely talented man. And of course, in his professional life, he was a wonderful fireman. He rose to the rank of third officer, which is the highest rank you could achieve without a university degree. And uh, to focus in on his singing career, he was, I suppose, terribly relaxed on stage. He had a great rapport with an audience. When John came on the stage with the guitar, he'd strum it once or twice and he'd go into the first song. And you know that fourth wall that they talk about at the front of the stage, which is the most important, the imaginary wall, like to get to the audience, that disappeared the minute John came out, you know. Did you, I'm, I'm sure you did get an opportunity to play with your dad on a few occasions? I did, yeah. Like, not professional, not, you know, doing gigs or anything, yeah. but we sat down and, you know, especially in West Cork, we spent a lot of time in West Cork on holidays and we'd go into a pub and take out the guitars and we'd play away all night, um, song for song. And, you know, my father was a kind of an entertainer that, that he'd get up and, you know, sing cold, you know, he'd just get up and walk around the pub with the guitar strapped onto him and, and he'd sing in, in front of people, in front of their tables and, you know, sit down again and have a point and get up again and sing but um, whereas most people would sit in the corner and you know you'd like to hear the background music you know but yeah. when you were in a pub with my father you'd, you'd know that you were with him <laughs> <laughs> and his, his book then was was absolutely lovely you gave me a copy of it and i had the opportunity to read it and it portrays a lovely simple honest to god fun way of growing up as a young lad here in the north side yeah yeah, well, like what you what you read in the book was the truth of it. Like you know, um, he covered all angles. I read the book over and over again, and I just found it fascinating. Like that, he could put so much information into it. You know, and as you as you know yourself, there's different stories. You can put the book down and pick it up again, and you know, it's easy reading. But um, he covered an awful lot of characters, stories, uh, traditions, recipes, and songs in it. 
and he was very proud of it and proud of the name too, the Red City. And as you know yourself, that, that name com comes from the roof tiles on the houses in Guadalajara. The colours of the roof tiles, was they were red um, and he, it, was, it was known as the Red City. So yeah, he was he, he got a great kick out of that book and I was actually above in Doolin there about two or three years ago. I set my wife went up for a, a weekend. So there's a little bookshop in Doolin just before you reach the pier, a second-hand shop, second-hand bookshop. And lo and behold, right in the middle of the stand was my father's book, uh, The Red City. So it did a bit of travelling, all right. You know? yeah. <laughs> As I review my life with you since the days of old I wouldn't think of changing things for all the world and its gold if I had my life to live over I'd do the same things again I'd still want to roam Near that place we called home Where our happiness never would end And I'd meet you when school days were over And we'd walk through the lanes we once knew Yes, if I had my life to live over I'd still fall in love with you I'd do the same things again I'd still want to roam In that place we called home Where our happiness never would end And I'd meet you when school days were over And we'd walk through the lanes we once knew Yes, if I had my life to live over, I'd still fall in love with you. Yes, if I had my life to live over, I'd still fall in love with you. I'm very grateful to everybody at the Northmont CBS School for allowing us to record here. This was, of course, the alma mater of the three Norries, and while none of them made the Cork Senior Hurling team, they certainly excelled in musical matters. According to Tony O'Shea, the changes since he was a student here are very evident. When you look around here and see how it is after changing in a few years, a lot of the building, buildings are still here. The memories that you would have from those buildings, like, would just come flying back to you, you know? It's a three school of academy, isn't it? Yeah. Primary, secondary, <coughs> and there's a Gwail school here. Gwail school, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the old Gwail school here across the way, but then the one was up where the old the old Christian Brothers uh, house was. That's doing very well now, that, that Gwail school. Um, there's um, a lot of people waiting to get in there. It's renowned for its Irish teaching and, you know, but yeah, I mean, the school itself was a great, it's a great school. You know, I mean, it's changed a lot now since we were here last. But, um, you know, it's, it still remains the man, you know, so. From a sporting point of view, then it would be mainly hurling here, would it? Yeah, mainly hurling, yeah, yeah. There was always the Harty team here. If you were on the Harty team here, that you, you were kind of given special preference, you know. Right. <laughs> so, like, you know, a lot of guys in our class played with the Harty team and they were left off their your school work, you know, to go training. And um, unfortunately for myself and the lads, we weren't very good with hurling, like. Well, our three Norries have certainly made up for that with their guitars. And that was Tony O'Shea, our third Nari, bringing the series to a close. Tony and his wife Jer are very pleased that the music tradition in the O'Shea family continues. Their musician son Robert plays in a band called The Guilty Judges. My thanks to John Neville, John Murphy and Tony O'Shea for joining me. We're not quite finished with the North side just yet. Ken Barrett was in sound this evening and thank you for joining us. Until Sunday evening next at 7, this is John Green wishing you a pleasant and a happy week and thank you for dropping by. For the 
Rockies thought that they were stars Till they met with St. Van Bars Here's up among St. the boys of Fair Hill And the Blackpool hens don't lay at all When they lays, they lay some small Here's up among St. the boys of Fair Hill